Yeah, listen to me. That's another Shema. Pay attention to this, God speaking here. Israel exhausted, exhausted. I like the title there. The New American Standard updated version has useful titles. Israel is being exhorted. Don't forget, you are Israel. If you're the true people of God, you are the Israel of God. The word is applied to you, to all servants of God. Listen to this. You who are pursuing being right. Righteousness means simply being right rather than wrong. Those of you who seek Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord God. Now, here's the advice to all of us this morning. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. What's that about? To the quarry from which you were dug. What are the origins of your faith, the true biblical faith? The answer is Abraham. Ah, Abraham, the father of a multitude of people. His name was originally Avram, exalted father. And they changed his name, God did, when he became the father of a multitude of different nations, Avrav Hamon. They changed his name to signify his new task, his new function. He is the father of the faithful. Note, as uh, Carlos was reading before, that he received this promise even before he was circumcised. So circumcision is even remote in one sense from Abraham, although he was so, uh, so, uh, circumcised on the eighth day and his children were and so on. That's true. However, he's the spiritual father of the new covenant people and Sarah, his wife, who gave birth to you in pain. So Abraham and Sarah are the great models of the new covenant in advance of the new covenant because we read in Romans that Abraham had the gospel preached to him ahead of time. If you like, Abraham is a model of faith, a sort of forerunner of Jesus, and he actually had the gospel. So your faith is said to be the faith of Abraham. You're to model your faith, not only on Jesus, but also go back to the story of Abraham and do what Abraham did. He believed God and it was reckoned to him, the Bible says, as making him right rather than wrong. So Abraham is to be a hero for you. You are to have the faith of Abraham and you're to have the faith of Jesus. God called him and blessed him and multiplied him. And so that then turns the uh, Isaiah writer, Isaiah, as they say in America, Isaiah in England. Indeed, the Lord is going to comfort Zion. There we come back to one of those powerful Isianic words. God is going to comfort Zion. The good news, this is the gospel. He's going to comfort all the waste, deserted places. The wilderness, lovely image of the wilderness, a barren area, going to turn it into the Garden of Eden. That is your goal. You are aiming at the Garden of Eden. You remember the thief on the cross when Jesus was dying said, remember me, please, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied to that thief on the cross was, I'll tell you right now, you don't have to wait till the future. I'm telling you right now today, you, because of your faith in me and my messianic program, will indeed be with me in that future Garden of Eden of the kingdom. That's the gospel. The desert is going to be like the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. It's all going to be turned into a stupendous a recovery, restitution. Now it really gets to be bursting with joy and gladness. Joy and gladness will be found in her, in Zion. Thanksgiving, and the sound of melody and singing. Isn't that marvelous? Isaiah is negative, has to be negative, speaking for God, about how bad mankind tends to be. But after a while, he comes back to this stupendous sense of joy. And so our theme is repeated. Bad news now. But wait and see what God is going to do. And you are going to be part of that if you've chosen to believe in this gospel of the kingdom. So look at this in 51.4. Pay attention. There's another Shema. Listen to this, my people. Give you to me, my nation. You are the nation of God. You are the Israel of God if you're a true believer. Israel, now blinded, we might then call them ethnic Israel. There's a bright, happy future for them too. Eventually, but right now they haven't got there. They're still not accepting as a whole at least they're not accepting their messiah look at verse three then i the lord will comfort zion 
There's the good news. There's the gospel. He will comfort all her desert places. Her wilderness would be like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness and so on. Verse 4, pay attention to me. Give ear to me. Listen to me. God has to insist that we listen all the time. A Torah will go forth from me. A law. What Torah are we talking about? The new Torah of Messiah, not the old Torah of Moses in the letter. Torah will go forth from me and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. It's all about justice. Justice is going to be done. I will repay, God says. He's going to make everything right. And he wants you to be part of that great restoration program. My righteousness is near. That's to say, the world as it will be set right is coming. That's exactly the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. My salvation, the kingdom of God, has already been announced. It's gone forth. My arms, arm being the symbol of your activity and strength, will judge the peoples. Will I'll set the people right. They're terribly wrong now, but I'm going to set them right. And the coastlands, I like to think of the British Isles over there to the west, wherever coastlands in the Mediterranean area would be, they will wait for me. My arm, my activity, my arm, my program, my restoration program, they'll wait for it. Just as Joseph of Arimathea was waiting for the kingdom. Do you remember in Mark's gospel? He was waiting for the kingdom. Jesus had been there. And certainly Jesus was showing the signs of the kingdom and the spirit of the kingdom, all that, the miracles of the kingdom. But the kingdom itself had not yet come and has still not yet come. But people will wait for this wonderful kingdom. And for my arm, they will wait expectantly. Verse 6, lift up your eyes to the sky and look to the earth beneath. The sky will vanish, the earth will wear out. This present system, the heavens and earth, are going to be changed. That's to say the world order is going to be radically, radically changed. We'll get to that probably next Sunday in the 15th and 16th verse of this chapter, one of the most brilliant restoration new heaven and earth passages. Its inhabitants will die in like manner. Yes, people will still actually be human, some of them, in that time. But my salvation, my immortality program will be forever. My doing right, my getting things right and straight will not wane, it will not fade. Listen to me, another Shema in verse 7. You who know right from wrong, and you do, those listening this morning who are familiar with the divine program, you know the difference between right and wrong. A people in whose heart is my Torah. What Torah are we talking about? The Torah of Moses in the letter? No, no, no. We're not talking about the Torah of the Moses in the letter. We're talking about the Torah of the new Moses, Jesus, the teaching of Jesus. And I've been stressing week by week that 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, you must believe the teaching of Jesus or you risk being scammed. You risk being rejected when Christ comes back. My righteousness in verse 8 will be forever my salvation. The book of Hebrews is a brilliant warning. It says, what? is going to happen if we neglect so great a salvation in the book of Hebrews, it says, I'll refer to it. It says, if you should dare neglect the salvation which was first preached through Jesus's mouth, it had its beginning, as the Greek says there in Hebrews 2, 3, it had its beginning in the gospel of the kingdom as preached by Jesus. Don't you dare neglect that because the results of that would be catastrophically bad. Okay, it gets more and more exciting, and they burst forth in singing here. Awake, awake, this is an appeal to God in verse 9. Put on strength, arm of the Lord. Go into action. Awake as you did in the days of old. Was it not you, and this ties in with Sarah's letter, lesson on the Passover, wasn't it you who cut Rahab? Rahab is a symbol of Egypt there. You, pursed the, you uh, pierced there the dragon. The Egyptian people were seen there as a dragon, as a great monster. And God dealt with them, as Sarah was saying at the Passover. He's going to do it again. It was you dried up the sea. Verse 10. The waters of the great deep, the Nile, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over. That ties in beautifully with what Sarah was saying to the younger people today. That stupendous miracle 
where the walls of water allowed the Israelites to pass on dry land. They're remembering that stupendous event, which is going to be repeated when eventually God sets everything right by sending Jesus back. Look at verse 11 here. The ransomed of the Lord, those who've been bought back from the slave market to be true believers, will return. They'll come with joyful shouting and go to heaven. No, no, no. Forget talking about going to heaven. Currently in Georgia, there's an advertisement on the television which says, what will happen to you if you die today? Will you go to heaven or not? That is a nonsense question. The Bible says nothing whatsoever, ever, ever about going to heaven. Why would you want to go to heaven when Jesus won't be there? He's coming back. So the truth of the Bible is established in verse 11. Everlasting joy will be on their heads. They'll obtain gladness and joy. They're bursting for the thrill of the prospect of the kingdom and sorrow and sighing and pain will disappear into thin air forever. Verse 12, I, even I, God says, am the one comforting you. There's a good comforting line for your coming week. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? Are you scared of men? No need for that. Men are very, very feeble in compared with God. If you've got God on your side, God arguing for you, you're doing well. Or the son of man, who is made like grass. The son of man means human being. He's only a weak, frail person until you become the son of man, which is Jesus. And of course, he's been immortalized. So he's full of strength. That you have forgotten. Have you forgotten? This is an appeal to all of you this week. Have you forgotten the Lord, your creator, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth? Have you forgotten him so that you are fearful continually, end of verse 13 here, all day long because of the fury of the oppressor, whatever furious oppressor you may have in your life. Don't be scared. God is still in charge. Verse 14, look at this, bursting with excitement. The exile, the one now taken captive, will soon be freed and will not die in the dungeon, nor will his bread be lacking. Is the positive good news, right? You're going to be freed from prison. You're going to get the bread which you might be lacking now. I am the Lord your God, in verse 15, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of the armies of heaven, that's Lord of hosts, is his name. Now, another uh, saying of God then to his servants, I have put my words in your mouth, go back to the agency principle. I have covered you, his agent, the Messiah, with the shadow of my hand to do what? To establish the heavens and found the earth. That's the new world order, the genuine new world order that is the work of this servant of God who is the Messiah primarily, but you're going to be involved in that too. So in verse 15 and 16, you have a marvelous picture of the coming kingdom. It refers to the future new heavens and earth, new world order of which Jesus is the architect working under the one God, his father. The one addressed here then is the Messiah. He's the agent of that new heaven and new earth. So that's the exciting time coming. I think perhaps we have time just to finish 17, possibly to 23. Rise yourself, wake up, arise Jerusalem. It's all about the city of Jerusalem and the kingdom that's going to come. You who have drunk from the Lord's hand, the cup of his anger, there's the bad news. Israel, the nation now in rebellion against God is going to be punished so that God can get Israel's attention. There's none to guide her. This is a rather pathetic scene in verse 18. All the sons she has borne none to guide them, nor is there one to take her by the hand among all the sons she has reared. These two things will have befallen Israel in prophecy yet. It's going to happen. Who will mourn for you? The devastation, destruction, famine, and sword. That's a bad time coming in the great tribulation for Israel. Your sons have fainted. They lie helpless at the head of every street, like an antelope in a net full of the wrath of God. So the wrath of God is going to be imposed upon now unbelieving Israel, the people who ought to be God's people, but have not yet accepted the Messiah. 
21 says this, therefore, please hear this, you afflicted. You are drunk, but not with wine. It has a comforting word then to people in distress. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, even your God, who contends for his people. That is to say, when he's ready to comfort them after having punished them. I see the chalice of my anger. You will never drink it again. These never again statements in scripture are very exciting. You're going to be punished, but after that, punishment will have taken its good effect, and I'll never again bring a great tribulation on you as I have to do it currently in terms of Israel. I will put that chalice of anger into the hand of your tormentors. God is going to repay those who are going to punish Israel in the future. Themselves will be punished because God's vengeance I will repay, says God. Justice is going to be done. I will put that chalice of anger in verse 23 to the hand of your tormentors, those people who will have been tormenting you in the great tribulation time that is due to come on Israel. Those who said to you, lie down that we may walk over you. That's the scene of complete subjection to your enemies. You have even made your back like the ground and like the street. For those who walk over it, there's a terribly bleak scene of a punishment coming in the Great Tribulation, primarily to Israel, but also to Christians who are so weak, so feeble, that they need to be chastised and get back to a full, strong Christian position. So we've gone rather quickly through 51 and 52, but I think you'll see the gist of what God is saying there to his people and to you and to Jesus as his servant. The new Moses of the new covenant, beginning with the gospel in Mark chapter 1, verse 1.